Holy moly, we are. We're live. <laughs> here, here we go. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Secret Ingredient Podcast, live cast, whatever we're calling this, uh, where we believe that everyone has a story behind the story, and that is where the secret ingredient lives. Unleashing that secret ingredient through a combination of personalized custom content, social media, and paid advertising is the best way to build the relationships you need to grow your business. Today, I am blessed to have my friend and uh, former facilitator at uh, Falls Leadership Class, which was amazing, Mr. Ned Parks from Aegis 360 Consulting. How you doing, Ned? Hey, man. I'll tell you what. I'm fantastic. What a, what a great way to round out the day. <laughs> we've been emailing back and forth some crazy stuff. And and uh, I put on my Facebook post that I loved how you said this will either be awesome or a beautiful train wreck. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's accurate. <laughs> well, let's see what we're let's see what we end up with, right? <laughs> I think uh, I think we'll be okay. So, folks, if uh, if you're joining us, you, you know, uh, if you don't know Ned, um, I'm not going to do an introduction because he'll kill me uh, if I did like a formal like bio reading. Oh God, but, please no, <laughs> no. But it is interesting. I, I got to start with this. So, you flew, piloted in Korea, yep. then started an aviation company. Yep. Business consultant. Yep. Author. Yep. App developer. Uh, well, yeah, I hired a developer, but it's was my yeah app my creator. Yeah, yeah, creator. That's probably good. Yep. So, how did that all like? That's kind of <laughs> what a what a smorgasbord that is. So yeah. I know there's got there's got to be some stories in there. So let's uh. Let's start. Tell me, tell me a little bit about Korea. I mean, because I'm guessing that's where you you kind of turned into a man and where where you learned some stuff. Yeah, I like to say that when I came home from Korea, my uh, liver filed assault and battery charges against me. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> they may use the same lawyer. That, that my <laughs> so like, uh, yeah, so I I was accepted into the uh, uh, warrant officer flight. I was a warrant officer in the army, except into officers uh, school, and then I went to army flight school full fly helicopters. And they, my, my first duty station was Korea. And uh, when they handed out the orders, I was still stateside, hadn't graduated yet. And I thought I was going to pass out. And it turned out to be one of the best years of my life. I mean, it was absolutely stunning. I, uh, you know, I love the culture. I love the people. I love the food. I loved everything about it. I mean, I, I thought I was going to hate it. And I ended up just absolutely loving it. I begged the army to, to leave me there and they wouldn't do it. But uh, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, we flew uh, in South Korea, obviously. Um, uh, all over the all over the country, uh, the job that I had, the unit I was in, we supported we supported different sites, and it was nation uh, uh, countrywide. So I got all the way to the south. I got all the way along the border. Um, it was absolutely a fantastic experience. It was great, and then drank like a fish. <laughs> well, that you know, it, it happens. Well, you know, so. my my quarters were literally. I shared the parking lot with the O Club. So I could, oh, I could roll yeah. back to my quarters and I was 20, I don't know, whatever I was, I'd have to do the math. And, you know, I was like, what else did you do? You, you got sober, you flew, and then you got drunk again. It went to sleep and you started the process over the next day. Oh my goodness. So you, you could just roll. You could, that, that's sort of a dangerous, convenient danger. Yeah, it really was, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, it was just a, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything in the world. It, it was fantastic. I'd go back in a minute in a minute, man, I'd go anywhere in Asia in a minute. I've been to several countries in Asia and I loved every last one of them I've ever been at. So what, what did you, what did you love? I've heard a lot of things about the culture itself. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I find the people, um, polite. I find them kind. Uh, they're compliant. I mean, it, it, it you know, they're a very compliant culture. If you say you have to do it, you, people just kind of do it. Um, but they're uh, they're fascinated with the West, and and they always want to make you a friend. So um, I was in uh, Vietnam in two thousand and something or other, and I was with a Canadian, and they'd come up and say, "Are you from the U.S.?" And he'd say, uh, "No, I'm from Canada." And then I'd say, "Yes," and they ignore him and talk to me. And uh, they're just they're, they 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 um, in Vietnam they want to know very much what we know about the war and what we think about it and why we're there. And it's not a ag antagonistic. It's it's very um, it, it, massive curiosity. I guess is the way I want to say it. Um, is is 
is what, and, and I find that true. And they all want to learn English. So I taught English when I lived there um, as a kind of a little second job. And that was a fat. So I got very good friends with, you know, a couple of doctors and some teachers and, the, you know, just folks. And, and the, the food is fascinating. It's not all, you don't want to eat it all, but it's fascinating. And some uh -huh. of it is phenomenal. I mean, some of it right. I would just die to eat, you know. Um, but, you know, they, uh, the other thing is, Adam, they look at life different than we do. A long-term plan to them is 100 years, and us, it's after lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so they look at right. success and failure as in the long game, you know. This is great, it's successful, and it'll die soon, and this is terrible, but it won't last long. So they just look at things different than we do, and it was just very eye-opening for me, and, and I loved it. S say that again about the this won't last long or the success is yeah. say that again. I, so I, I they, that. They, they they look at life in what I call the long game. So this is successful, it's great, business is wonderful, uh, but it won't last long because because they have a history that's gone tens of thousands of years. You know, they've been through occupation, they've been through strife, they've been through, you know, you name it, right? I mean, if you read anything about any of the Asian histories at all, or anything along the Pacific Rim, um, they've had their fair share of ups and downs. So they say, yeah, this is terrible. We'll get through it. This is great. It won't last long. Terrible is just around the corner. And we'll hmm. deal with that when we get there. And they do. Interesting. For the most part, you know? Right. Anything about... Um I always think of a, a different respect level in, in Asian cultures. Well, the respect they have for their, their, at least in Korea, and I think this is true throughout the Pacific Rim, but in Korea, the, I was stunned at the respect that they have for their elders. And uh, nursing homes probably exist, but certainly not like ours, because you just you you do whatever you have to to, to take care of mom and dad. They in, would be in more the mortified to. I to think send so. Them yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, uh, I, I mean, it's, you know, it was really fascinating. I mean, I had uh, one very dear friend who, an American soldier over there, a pilot with me, and he's married to a Korean woman, and her mother lived with them, and it was just what they did. And she was in her 80s or whatever. She'd survived the Japanese occupation, and everything else. And, and it was just, that's just what they do. I mean, it's just, it's just what they do. And then the other thing that I found fascinating is, their outward affection for babies and children is universal and across the board. It's absolutely fascinating. It struck me and it struck all of us over there. So it was like, if you're in the middle of the, of the generational uh, sandwich, you show phenomenal respect and care up above. And then this nurturing love and, and uh, uh, care for those that are younger, especially, especially infants and children just in a just a different way. I'm not saying they uh -huh. love their children more than we do. You know, God, you know, let's not, you know, come through the computer and kill me. It just, it's very visual. It's a very well, I, open I, I, visual thing. That's the word that I heard was outward. Outward yeah, very. visual. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting. Yep. Um, and, and that ties into something that we'll talk a, a little bit later about. Go figure. Um, I'm going to ask you about failure and vulnerability uh, oh, la la okay. later on. So okay. yeah, you know, yeah. this, this outward, this visualization is is uh, kind of something that you, you and I tend to talk about every time we every time we get together. <laughs> yeah, for whatever yeah. for whatever reason that right, is right, right, right. So you you leave Korea. Yep. You come home. How long were you there? I was there twelve months to the day. Okay. That was a typical. Yeah, that was a very typical um, assignment. It okay. was considered a, what's called a hardship tour. So 12 months was a hardship. You couldn't take your dependents with you. Uh, two years was uh, for usually upper officers that they needed there longer and they were allowed to take uh, dependents, uh, family, whatever. But um, it was a, a, a uh, what's called a hardship tour. So it's a year. To the day, boom. You, I showed up on October 1. I left on October 1. So you come home and you're still you're still in the service. You go back to a base somewhere. I, yeah, went to Fort Rucker, Alabama, as a flight instructor, and I lobbied to get there. I really worked hard to get there. Um, uh, I was uh, that was my first duty station, and so for whatever reason, I I mean I won't bore you with the stories, but I figured out I kind of liked teaching, and I liked uh, working with people. I just did, and uh, so <clears throat> in the army as an aviator, 
you had what they called um, three main uh, areas of expertise that you could choose as part of your career track. One of them was maintenance. So you were a pilot, but you ran the entire maintenance operation for a unit and all the maintenance operation fell under you and you would be a maintenance test pilot. The other was safety. So you'd run safety, which could include you know, going and doing crash investigations and so on and so forth, and then okay. writing policy for safety. And then the third was what the Army calls standardization. You and I would know it as instructing and teaching. And we were the group that said, if there was a new, new whatever, we would learn it first and then teach it to everybody else and give annual check rides. For whatever reason, I just wanted to do that. And getting to do that as, as early in my career as I was, was really, really difficult. So I lobbied in Korea. And then when I got back, I was actually had orders to go to um, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, I actually got in my car and I drove down to the military personnel center and I saw my career management officer. And I, I, I said, I want to go to Fort Rucker. I want to be an instructor. And he looked and said, you know, my job is to fill holes in the army. That's what I do. And right now I'm overstocked with pilots in Fort Campbell and um, I need them at Fort Rucker. So go. And it was uh, the best thing that I could have done. So I, I then went there and I spent three, a little over three years there teaching in the classroom as well as, as a flight instructor. So was that your first sort of taste of instruction or leadership or? Yeah. Yeah. The, the army. So when they made you an instructor, they didn't, uh, they sent all of us to an instructor school. And, and so I was in there with, in the, the classroom, I was in there with, sergeants that were going to teach the sergeant topics and and technical people that were going to teach technical and other pilots that were going to be flight instructors. And you learned uh, 160 hours of classroom instruction. You learned psychology and you learned how to have platform skills and you learned how to um, platform it'd be presentation skills in our language. Uh, you learned how to design and curriculum design and utilize subject matter experts. If you had to design a course you didn't know anything about. And then it was another month of flying every day and then a check ride to be a flight instructor. So it was really two months of training, solid, hundred, you know, full time. You know, it's the military; they overdo everything and they do it right. And, right. And and I just fell in love with it. I just really, really liked it. So, so is is that a structure that you've brought forward that they do it? You said they instruct and they do it right. Is that is that a structure that that you see you still implement? to this day? Or? I, I, well, I certainly, it's, you know, when I work with clients now, I certainly probably uh, drag a piece of that with me. There's no question. I also have run my own businesses and I understand what a profit and loss looks like. And I understand right. what margins are. And, and you know, XYZ company does not have unlimited checkbooks like the military does. Right. And they, they and, and, and it, for good reason, I mean, you know, I'm glad that the army isn't, I mean, they have a budget and they have to live within their budget, but a profit isn't the overriding, you know, goal there. The goal is to right, make you right. really, really good at what you do. And um, so, I mean, I certainly get both sides of it and there's a limit to what you can do on the, on the for-profit side of the house. But, you know, I'm always pushing my clients that you probably ought to overtrain and over-prepare and you'll have a lot better results on the back end. Some are willing to do that and some aren't. <laughs> right. Like, like anything. <laughs> like how's, anything. How's that work? How's that work out? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> sometimes I look at people and go, well, that didn't work too well, you know, but I had a client look at me one time and say, do I actually pay you to talk to me like this? <laughs> yeah. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm professional about it, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And if you, if I'm not going to tell you the truth and you know, you can get, you can get somebody a lot cheaper than me to tell you a lie. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I just don't get we can it. Do, you know? We can do that much cheaper. We, oh we, yeah, much cheaper. I mean, fact, buy me a beer and I'll, yeah, buy me a beer and I'll tell you lies all day. If that's Careless what you whispers, want. right at you, no problem. Right. <laughs> oh, so it, you? I'll interject something just because yep. it, it's a good segue. You, you talking about clients, and you think of business consulting, business coaching. Um, are you okay with the term business coach, or is it business consultant? What? So I'm jumping uh, ahead, but it's no, worth. no, that's okay. So that's, <clears throat> you know, it's funny. I had this conversation with somebody earlier today. He said, I understand you do coaching. And I said, Oh my God, please understand something different. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, a business coach is fine. Uh, the, the only, the only issue I have with it is more from an executional side, Adam. Oftentimes when people in the, in this world think of a coach, they think of somebody, um, that, 
uh, fixes broken people. And, okay. and I, I'm not, I'm not interested in fixing broken people. Um, it's, and it's not that I'm heartless. It's not that I don't want to help. That's not where I'm coming from. It, it, let me tell you my experience with it. Uh, oftentimes I get the call from VP or whomever. Hey, uh, Bob over here is uh, failing at his job and you need to fix him. And, and, and oftentimes there, there's so many things wrong with that conversation. First is, well, what the hell are you doing right. besides, besides not your job? Yeah. Don't we need to fix you? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. So that's that. Well, and I, and I, we, we have that conversation. So then, then oftentimes when I peel the curtain back, I find out that what they really mean is we really want to fire Bob and we want to check off one more block before we do that. So we want to hire Ned so we can check off the block so we can say, see, we did everything and we're going to fire him. And, and I'm not interested in that. That's just, you know, I'm not, I'd rather, if you're going to hire me to do that, just tell me up front, let me come in and talk Bob into quitting and help Bob find a new job. I mean, let's just be big boys and girls and say, this isn't working out with Bob. But the, the other thing I, I oftentimes say when I get these and I try to turn them down now is, okay, so if I start working with Bob and find out you're the problem, how do you want me to bring that to you? And, and, and the conversation gets mm. real quiet, quiet real quick. Because here's what I know for a fact. It took two people to dance and somebody stepped on somebody's feet and right. somebody and, and somebody didn't get their feet out of the way. So, you know, I, you're not without some level of of obligation here is in into Bob not performing wherever you want Bob. Now, look, there's extremes. There's Bob that's, you know, not sober and, you know, is completely off the pale. And I, I get it, you know, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about that. You know, those are the fringes. That's the 5% on either, either side of the bell curve. Let's talk about everybody in the bell curve. When we're in the bell curve, guess what? There's two of us that are playing here and there's something about you that's not playing well with Bob. And, and oftentimes we need to have that conversation. What I like from a, from a coaching standpoint is when people say, I just, you know, Nat, I'm, I own my company and I don't have anybody to talk to and I need somebody to smack me around a little bit and I need some, you know, fine. Um, and I, you know, the, the other piece of it is a lot of times what I like to say is oftentimes I don't, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I'm the guy that's seeing the forest for the trees. Cause you live in it all day. And I just walked in here and right, I can, right. and, and I see things you don't see and they go, how do you see, how did you see that? Well, cause I'm, you know, how, it's like you in your house and I walk in and you say, I can't find my glasses. I say, Adam, they're right in front of you. You know, man, I walked past them 50 times, right? right. We've all had that experience. Of course. And oftentimes the other thing, the other value that I bring is not so much brains, although I've certainly see a lot of things fail and succeed. So I'm willing to share that, but perspective, um, you know, Adam, I've worked with about 500 different organizations in 20 years. Good grief. Uh, you know, you get in there and I can walk in and smell the tension or the success yep. or the, you know, I can see the landmines that they're stepping on every day. And it's just from experience. That's all it is. So, you know, it's not, again, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I can just, sometimes I just have a different set of eyes. I can see it different and I'm willing to go, eh, do you think about that? Well, you, you said that you said the word perspective and that's, I mean, that's really what it is. If I'm looking at it like this, uh, I can only see right. so many things, right? right. If I come around right. to another angle and very often, if you're in a position of, of, and I'll use the word leadership, but, but what I mean is authority, not really leadership, sure. like, like we would use it. Right. But if you're in a management position or a leadership position, you, you're, you only know how to look at it one way and you, you right. have to look at it that way. Absolutely. And, you need that other perspective. Well, you know, we look, um, I, and I know in a lot of organizations for a lot of people, this is a dirty word, but um, I always like to say, you know, stop, stop fighting diversity so much because it's diversity for diversity's sake. You know, I kind of like, I'd like the lens of everybody that's out there, their eyeballs, look at, look at things different than mine. Right. So from a, from a, you know, from a, an economic standpoint, from a delivery standpoint, from a, 
how do we look to our customer standpoint? It'd be kind of nice to have somebody looking at this a little different. I always, you know, I love to get online and find, you know, advertising failures and they're easy to find. And, and, you know, you, <laughs> you know, it's like, God, what were you thinking? Right. right? What did, who, did that? Who approved no. this? Who approved, who approved it? this? Well, well I'll tell you who approved it. Uh, uh, and, and it doesn't matter who they are, but they all looked exactly alike. Their backgrounds were the same. The color of their skin was the same. Their gender was right. the same. Their age was the same. Their education is the same. The, the way they look at the world is the same. And that I don't care who that same is. They're bound to make that mistake. And it's like, oh my gosh, did you, did you, you know, why don't you read this back to yourself? You know, I mean, it's like, you got to be kidding me. Well, no, I mean, no, one country. of the most famous ones was Electrolux vacuum cleaners. It's still out there. They had a, they had a, an ad, they put it in print. Nothing sucks like an Electrolux. <laughs> are, are you got to be kidding me? You actually put this in print. In the 1950s, no less, right? Yeah, that's not good. You, you, I, don't, I don't think you can say that. I, they did. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you can say that. That's that's no bueno. That's frowned upon. You can you can get in trouble for that, Ned. I just telling you. <laughs> there's others. I won't even share them with you, but you know. Well, it, inter interesting segue. Earlier, you said something, uh, and and I'm going to segue off the word "suck." Um, you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned when you start an engagement with somebody and, and the boss, right. And you say, Hey, if we find out that this is your fault, how do you want me to deliver that news? Right. So, so talk to me a little bit about a framework to deliver bad stuff to people that matter. Right. So, so people of authority, right. That's a, that's kind of a weird thing to do. And yeah. you set the tone, you set the table with that. What an interesting concept that is. Yeah. So um, I think the pre-work has to have everything in it. Uh, so I tell, as an example, I tell uh, subordinates, if I'm working with a subordinate team, I'll say, have you talked to your boss about how they want bad news delivered to them? And, and, and this is what you get, which of course the answer is no. Right. Yeah. And by the way, boss has never said, Here's how I want you to deliver bad news to me. And and it's it's on its face unbelievably simple and in practice hardly anybody does it. Now here's the real interesting thing. If I were to take a survey of leaders and 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 say all the things you hate and give them a list and have them rank them in order. And I had buried in there being left in the dark about bad news. They'd probably rank it in the top three. So it's really interesting. I tell people your actions, not right, congruent. Right. right. I, I tell people all the time, the last thing you want to do is leave your boss in the dark. I don't care what else you do. Don't leave your boss in the dark. And I worked for a, a two-star general for a short amount of time on a little rotation I was on out at Fort Rucker. And I'll never forget. He said, Ned, he goes, I never want to be the last one to find out. So I will not yell at you for what went wrong, but I will eviscerate you if I'm not the first to know. And it'll be because I wasn't the first to know, not what went wrong. And there was this, there was this captain, and of course, uh, captains outranked warrant officers. Uh, this captain who I worked with, and he said, oh, my God, he came. He said, oh, blah, blah, blah. He tells me this thing. And I said, well, have you told the old man? And, and for those who are not in the military, the term old man is a, a term of endearment to the, to the, to the commander. So it's, it's, a, it's a, you know. Have you told the old man? He goes, no, no, I'm just going to fix it. I said, Captain, I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> I said, I know he gave you the same speech he gave me. Well, I got to tell you, Adam, it was like three days later. I don't think I've ever heard a butt chewing coming down a hallway like I heard. And yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't about what went wrong. It was because the captain didn't tell the general and general found out from somebody else. And, and it that was a great lesson. Thankfully, it wasn't a lesson I had to pay the price on, but it was a lesson I got to watch. And I went, wow. You know, think about it a minute. I don't want to be the last to know. And and so this is a conversation we need to have. I I I do a thing called new new leader assimilation. So when somebody comes in, um, I come in as an outsider and I work with the team 
and, and I have a series of questions and I throw the leader out and I ask the questions of the employees and I write them on the flip chart and then they leave and then the boss comes in and then I work the boss through, here's everything. And one of the questions I ask is, how do you want bad news delivered to you? And I've now I've done, I don't know how many of these over the years. I've never, I, I, I it's been amazing. Most leaders, and these are even inexperienced leaders will go, um, is there more to this than I don't know? I don't know. Just tell me. They, they're they so, they're stunned at the question because they just really, most people just want to know. Most good, most good ones want to know. And, and then I also say, what if it's bad news that they know you're going to disagree with? Oh. And, mm. and, and it opens up a great conversation, right? Because, really great leaders listen to people that disagree with them. Well, I mean, how, else, how else are you going to learn anything? Well, I, 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 I hell, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't know. You know, every great leader is, as they say it in different ways, but they all say the same thing. You know, there's been a whole book written about uh, Lincoln, you know, team arrivals that when he became president, he stacked his cabinet with people that disagreed with him. Um, I think it was uh, Eisenhower and Patton both said some similar kind of stuff. I mean, I won't get the quotes exact, but they said, you know, look, give them the job and get the hell out of their way. They're going to do it different than you do and ignore it. Go do something else. You know, make sure you get good people in there. Steve Jobs said, why do you hire really smart people and then tell them how to do their job right. or something like, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, but you get the point. And I don't get these leaders that have to micromanage. I said, man, get over yourself. I, however smart you are, you're not smart, as smart as you think you are. It doesn't matter. Just get over yourself. Right. Well, isn't there something to be said for coming at the job differently? Again, this is this perspective thing in different <laughs> right. lenses. But coming at, a, coming at a task or a problem with a different solution that may even come from somewhere else. You think of, I, I'm going to get this wrong, but like Akron became like the tire capital, I believe, whenever they married, wasn't it Fabric? With with the tires, isn't that wasn't that invented no, here? Yeah. Doilies might, or something, something it, like that. It might be. Yeah, I can't remember. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of all kinds of weird things that have happened. You know, when you look at it, and um, you, you know, I, <clears throat> I mean, diversity of thought to me is really important. And and a leader that doesn't want to hear or the critics, and, and I even call, sometimes they're not even critics. They're just it's just sometimes just a different idea. I'm not criticizing you. That's a good idea. This is another good idea. Let's sort out the good ideas. Maybe we, may, Adam, I kind of like the criticism. Well, I I, I, I kind of yeah. like it because that means it's my fault, right? Which means I can do something about it. Fix it. It's so I easy to fix. fix. It's, yeah. clean. it's my fault. Awesome. And, and I often, can actually do something about this. Right. And oftentimes, there are really little things that you could say. Oh, all right, all right. Yeah, I can stop doing that or I can start doing this or yeah, Just move that over there. Occur. Didn't even occur to me. Like, yeah, absolutely. I could clean this right. up in two seconds. All right, right, right. It, it To me, it's not a big deal. Here's the problem. We And I think this could spin out of control. This could create that train wreck right here, but whatever. <laughs> um, it, you know, we're in a, we're in a really heightened place right now in this country, but I think we've been here at different levels for a very long time. And I think a lot of people's thinking just uh, is this, and it's, they think in either or terms. And I mm -hmm. go, could we replace either or with the words both and? And Whoa. just see, let, maybe we go back to either or. I'm fine with that, but let's just put them in here and see what happens as we try to work through this. And I don't know. It's just a thought. It's it's a thought experiment, you know, so you could pick your topic and it's either this or it's that. And I go, what if it's both this and that? Just where does that take our conversation? What happens to our thought process here? I don't know. I had, to pop, I had to pop it on the screen. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good stuff. Forget yeah. either or try both in. Well, because what are we missing? Because we're dismissing things that maybe don't need dismissed. Yep. And and maybe maybe we can include them and somewhere in the middle is the answer somehow well, in the middle in the middle of that bell curve. Yeah, because what goes what goes hand in hand with either or is right wrong. Mm. Mm hmm. And then there's no other option. 
right? That's very black and white. Yeah, no, and then people so retreat. Much, and right. so much gray. Right, then people retreat to their corners and they're not even willing to have a conversation now about the location of the door. Forget some social issue. God, I don't even want to go down that road, right? But but right. if we could just change the vernacular a little bit, I think we could change a lot of things in small issues that we're trying to work out in our companies and and so on and so forth. Forget the societal side of the house. You know I mean? That's a whole other conversation. We could have 27 podcasts on that. Well, maybe we, maybe we won't maybe go we live. <laughs> maybe we won't go live on that one. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that sounds dangerous. I, I, I'm fairly quiet publicly, but privately I'm a firecracker. Yeah. Right. Comes right. To that stuff. Right. Oh man. I, I, uh, I, I love I love the idea of the the being able to have real conversations. That's actually I'm going to bring something up that you said uh, will really get you fired up. Mission statements. I was going to start the conversation with what's your mission statement, Ned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we're going to have a slight different opinion, but I, but I bet we really don't. Um, typical mission statements are dumb. Mm -hmm. they're, they're terrible. Yep. They're awful. They they typically don't say anything. It's a lot of stuff. We have integrity. Well, no crap. Of course, if you don't have integrity, you shouldn't even be in business. Like that's really something that you got to write on a piece of paper right. in order to make sure. It, no one can recite them. They have no idea uh, whatsoever, nothing. But part of, so I look at it a little bit differently. There's this idea of guiding principles rather than mission statement and has actions, has, yeah. uh, you know, certain things that are actually sure. real. One of them internally at Digital Sandwich is we have real conversations. That we have real conversations here. Mm -hmm. Internally, externally, we have real, even when they're hard, even when they're difficult, even when they're telling me that I'm an asshole. I, it's let's have real conversations. Why would you waste any minute right. of your time here talking to anyone? Pretending to be someone who you are not in a position that you th that you don't believe in. I just, I don't understand not having real conversations. Well, um, so there's a couple things that you've brought up. So the first, let me attack the mission statements quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, most of them are crap. Mm -hmm. um, most people have no idea about the history of the mission statement. So it came from the military. That's where it started. Military really? does it, yeah. Military does it exceedingly well. Um, so when I, I'll never forget, when I signed into Korea, I signed into my unit. Um, I came the first day to work. I walked in and there was this big poster and it had the unit crest up there and the name of the unit. And it said, I'll never forget it, provide air traffic control from the ground to 600 feet in the Republic of South Korea. Mission. Was it? So this unit had all the air traffic controllers in the country fell under our unit and we provided all the air traffic control from the ground up to 600 feet. The air force took over after that. So I, I go down the hall, I report into the Colonel and he and I are having a get to know you chat over a cup of coffee. And he said, Mr. Parks, he said, uh, uh, do you know our mission here? I said, yes, sir. It was on the poster out there. And I, and I recited it and he said, good, that's what we do. Okay. I knew done conversation over. Wasn't yep. sexy. It, it wasn't sexy but it was clear and it was easy to remember. And I've never, ever forgotten it. Right. So now we have these things that are like this because corporate America took it and said, well, you know, if it's that short, it can't be good. So it's gotta be long. So, so then they, they go around and they, they have everybody stand in a circle and write a word on a card. And then they hand the card in and then they take the cards and they shuffle them around. They come up with a mission statement. Um, it's a bunch of posturing. It it's a bunch of posturing it, bullshit yeah, is what it, it is. Right, right. Yeah. It's a bunch of posturing. Right. It's so, authentic, however, right. like the one that you're talking about. You, right. They can serve a purpose, but it has to oh, be sure. real. It has to Absolutely. be authentic. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's the good bullshit. Yeah. Here's the good ones. The good ones have a noun and a verb. They and they and they and this is critical. They paint a picture in your head. You know, our brains are visual operating systems. Every right. word that I'm saying right now, people are hearing and their brain is converting it into a picture. Yep. Okay. And then it gets in the reverse. So a really good one 
has some sort. So I'll give you a great, I'll give you a, a, a really good example of one, um, <laughs> which, which I, I love. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it, right? It paints a picture. Now your picture and mine are totally different, but it's a picture. It's got the noun and the picture are the same thing and the action or the verb are the same thing. And if it doesn't do those two things in a sentence, then, then you, you have nothing. Now, what I like to say is I'm less interested in a mission statement and I'm much more interested in the story. So, right. sure, sure. you know, I, I'll use this example. Um, God, we've got this mission statement and, and it's over here and the guys out in the yard uh, don't, don't really know what it says. I go, the guys in the yard are coming here 55 hours a week to get overtime because that's the only way they can make enough money because they're making eight bucks an hour and they're loading bricks on pallets and they're working in the rain and the snow and the sun and the dust and everything else. And if you think a mission statement is going to get them jazzed and get them to load the bricks better, you're out of your freaking mind. I, I said, you know, so, so that's not going to do it. But what this one organization did is they took uh, pictures, sometimes pictures and sometimes uh, renderings, if it, the architectural renderings of where those bricks were going to go. And they said, these bricks that we're making are going to go to Denver and be part of a pedestrian mall. And this is what it looks like. Just a quick picture. And they put it in the sleeve. That was the order. Every single person that touched that order knew where those bricks were going to go. That's a mission statement. It was done with a picture. Totally transformed, it, tr totally transformed the buy-in. A total. Because now yep. it's real. It's now not it's real. Medical. Right. It's right. not, I'm making a brick. Yep. I'm making a sidewalk in Denver. Yeah. And it, it's a story. It's, yeah. it's story. And the story was told through a picture. You didn't even have to be able to read to, to know what was going to go on. And it was the easiest thing to do. And oh my God, you, you would, when I bring this idea up and I try to get companies to do this, you would think I'm asking for their firstborn. <laughs> it is well, stunning to me the kind of resistance I run into. And I go, my God, this doesn't even take a budget. No, it, it doesn't. It, it takes a little bit of thought. That's all. A little effort. It, it takes a little bit of thought. A little effort. To, 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 your, to your point about it, back to the that they're all BS and whatever, because they use dumb <laughs> words that don't really mean anything. They're right. empty. You know, if you just look at the at the phrase mission statement, that right there should tell you a little bit of something, right? right. Mission, mission. Right. You you flew missions. Do they something. Were, yeah, yeah. That, you you flew mission. A mission is rescuing the princess. It's throwing the ring into Mordor. It's you know right. fighting Darth Vader, whatever. And in statement, it's not it's not a little whisper <laughs> or a little. It, it is an emphatic proclamation. So if it if it's neither of those things then what the hell is even the point? I, I it, couldn't agree more. That's why all, I get fired up about them. <laughs> I, I I get it. I get fired up about them too because they're bad. I think they're, oh, they're I, terrible. I think they're worth making good, however. When, so, you can, when you can do a good one, right? when you can do a good one, I think to think about a nonprofit. Would a nonprofit get a whole lot of donations if they didn't have a clear mission? You know exactly what your money is going to. Right. So if a if a business makes a mission statement that that's that is that powerful, and you're exchanging goods for money, goods or services for money, and I know what mission I'm supporting as well, right? That's powerful. Yep. If we if we made mission statements like like a nonprofit, and oftentimes it's just a story. It, it really is. What what is it? What is the story? What am I for, what am I donating right. to? For profit or not for profit, sometimes it's just a story. If you pay attention to um, a, a lot of the really strong advertisements on TV, I, I, I think about this and they interview, interviews the wrong word, uh, they use real employees. Right, right. Doing their job. Mm -hmm. they're, they're telling the story. It may not have a beginning, a middle and an end like, a you know, but they're telling the story. They're doing the job, and they're and they're like you and I. You know, they're banging out a living every day, right? right? And, well, it's, and it's I, much more compelling. It's, it's much, much more, more compelling. compelling. Absolutely. Because that's why the last two months have been so freaking weird. Because we we crave interaction. We crave. We're hardwired for the story, right. so right. we connect with that immediately. We connect right. with that story. 
we can see ourselves because at the end of it, it's not who cares. It's I, I, I know that guy. I don't right. know that guy, but I know that guy. I know that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, yep. Mission statements. <laughs> All right. Back to back to so you came home and then yep. you start an aviation company. Uh -huh. that, okay, you get out of the service. Right. I, I went right. into our yeah, I got out of active duty, went on to the Army Reserves at a, a flight unit down in Columbus. And of course, you know, weekends and two two weeks a year and so on and so forth. And then um I I started my own company and I said I'm gonna be in the aviation business. So I found an airport um, in Millersburg, Ohio, that was looking for somebody to manage the airport and run the business. So I went and started it. And then I got a name for myself and we moved to Akron Fulton with a couple of investors um, by the air dock, the big, um, right, the, the right. big limp hanger. And then uh, a, a, a service company became for sale at Akron Canton and we moved down there. And then um, I actually had um, a manufacturing company that had a subsidiary aviation company and they, uh, we're looking to hire a new manager to run that and through a recruiter and they kind of came after me a little bit and recruited me and I worked with them and I said, yeah, I think I want to do that. So I sold off to a partner I had and I went and worked for this company, did exactly the same thing. And then uh, that took me up to uh, uh, 2000 ish. And then I made a transition to this business um, in 2000. So that's the short story. How do you get from there to, to business consulting. So, um, what, what drew yep. you? How so, so the training was a big piece of it, and a lot of people think, well, that's different than consulting, and it is. Um, I don't. We do a lot of project work consulting, but that's uh, some of it's around training, and some of it isn't. But uh, I was really lucky at the the last real job that I had when I ran this division for this manufacturing company, and that they they made me. I ran the division. And then I was also on a corporate team that did two things, internal training and internal consulting. And we would help other departments and so on and so forth. And I got, I liked it. I'm kind of good at it. I think you tend to be good at things you like to do. So that's not a big surprise there. Um, if you don't like to play the guitar, you're probably going to be pretty lousy at it, you know, even if you have the mental capacity. So I like it. Um, so um, I have always had that entrepreneurial spirit and, I got to a place I said, you know, there's not a lot more I can do here um, and I want to go back on my own. And so I, I launched into this and, and it always, you know, the training was a big piece of it because I trained in the army and I was a flight instructor and then did a lot of internal training in the company. So that really was an easy ride. And then this business over the 20 years, you know, has been like every we've evolved and said, you know, there's right. opportunity there and, and can I do that? And is it within my wheelhouse? Yes, it is. Or no, it's not. And, I've done a few things that I said, oh, I won't do that again. And other things like, I want to do a lot more of that. And, you know, I want to do a lot more of that, but I'm going to do it different. You know, I mean, the same evolution that every other, every company has. Right. So Ned, what's the, what's the payoff? And, and I don't mean when the money hits the bank account, right. what's the, what's the payoff with, with what it is that you do? Um, I think the payoff, at least for me is probably two things, Adam. I, uh, there's uh, uh, Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive, and he talks about some really compelling, really compelling studies out there about motivation. And the three things that he talks about are purpose, mastery, and and autonomy. And if you can give those two, three things to an employee, you'll motivate them to now to the end of the world. And 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 so I have all three of those here. I can be as masterful, I can be as good at this as I want to be. Um, there's no there's no restriction on how good I can be. And, and that comes through creativity and innovation and trying new things and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, so I, I, that there's no breaks on me there. I'm 100% autonomous. I mean, I completely work on my own. I can say no to anybody I want. I can say yes to anything I want. So I have that. And, and then the purpose is, you know, partially internally is I, I really value managing my own schedule and I really value um, having uh, control over my own destiny. Um, I probably value that higher than money. I could probably make more money working for somebody, uh, but I value this and I, I would give up the other two and I don't like to give that up. So I think that's really it. Um, the, the innovation and the, um, the ability to jump out there and try something new, the entrepreneurial spirit 
Um, and then of course, obviously the, you know, there's an upside financial reward upside that I can make. So I guess that's probably where it is for me. And, and let me tell you something, it's taken me a long time to be able to put it into a hundred words or whatever I just used. I mean, right. used, I used to explain it. It took me a week and now I can get it down to 30 seconds or whatever. You, you don't think that's basically like a mission statement? Oh, maybe an <laughs> internal one. I don't know. <laughs> Jackass. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So I, you you brought up bell curve earlier, and I think of I think of business consultants, business coaching, of being on one end, uh, and and this is completely wrong. I know better than this, but I think many people think this way that it's one end of the, spe of the spectrum or another. One is cheerleader, and the other is criticizer. Mm -hmm. And somewhere, somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle is where you want to be, right? right. That's, right. that's where, that's where you can affect people in a positive way. Right. Yeah. I, and, and I think it's what I like to call it is a measured approach, you know, let, mm -hmm. let, so, you know, I like to just listen and, and understand. I, um, pe people say, what's your skill in this business? And I guess, um, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I, I'm pretty damn good at figuring out A, your business and B, your culture in a really short amount of time. I'm really good at being able to uh, winnow down through the, the lingo um, and, and understanding what it means that, and the impact that's there. Um, but like the like the industry lingo that... The yeah, or even, whatever. yeah, it doesn't even have to be industry so much as it just has to be the lingo used within the organization, even, you know, okay. I mean, and again, you know, it's perspective and it's, it's experience. I go, okay, I'm going into an organization and they're 85% engineers. And, and that that's, there's not a, well, there's a lot of jokes there, but that's not the point of it. Right. I right. could say the same about 85% of social workers. Right. But um, it's 85% engineers and they work in aerospace. So I kind of have a pretty good idea how they're going to think and respond to things. And I have a pretty good idea what their struggles are going to be, and 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 only because I've done it, you know, it's not it doesn't make me it doesn't make me smarter necessarily, but I've kind of done it, and I've been able to say, yeah, I kind of feel that it's going to be here, it's going to be there, and and um, and, and I think that's the one thing that helps. I, I'm also not phased by much, Adam. I mean, I've had things right. said privately as well as in a group of thirty people that some of it I wouldn't repeat here on this. I, I mean, I, I was wow. like, I was like, did you just really say that? I mean, <laughs> I'm standing in front of 60 people. Did you just say that? Really? I asked somebody that one time. I said, did you just say that out loud? <laughs> so, you know, it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it'll come flying around and I'll have clients go now, you know, so-and-so is going to be in the room and we can't have them at the same table. And it's like, Oh my God, get over it. You know, fine. Let's put them up. You know, I, I there's not a lot that I'm, I'm afraid of. Right. You know, there just isn't. Well, that's and, that posing and posturing and not being real crap. Right. Well, and something else I learned a long time ago in this early on. Um, and that was, I, I, I do not engage in arguments with my clients. That's a right. no, that's a no sum gain there, baby. Let me tell you. Yeah. No one's winning that. Nobody's winning that. I will absolutely engage in disagreements with you, but I will not engage in an argument. And I, and I've got a, a thing that I now say, and it works every time. Well, that's just a professional disagreement. So yeah, I, we'll I come back to that. Right. So yeah. I, I had a client and I was, uh, they had, uh, had me working on their team and they were trying to hire uh, somebody pretty high up in the organization and that they'd flown this person in and we'd spent three or four days with them and I'd spent some time alone with them and so on and so forth. And, and um, so we were having a debrief call after this guy left and went back to wherever he was from. And he had said that the, there was a job, uh, the director's job where he currently works had come open about a year and a half ago. And, and the, the CEO of this organization had asked him, why didn't you apply or did you apply for it? And he said, no. And, and they said, well, why not? And he said, I didn't feel I was ready at the time. Okay. It's an answer, 
right? Well, mm -hmm. I I actually went, wow, that's some that's some pretty savvy self assessment. There is what that is. That that gave I was like this for this guy, right? Mm -hmm. In the debrief, uh, she said that showed a real lack of leadership to me. Oh. And I and I said I said well I said you know I think that showed an unbelievable strength of leadership. Right. And, and we went back and forth. And it wasn't an argument necessarily, but it was a certainly. I said finally said, well you know this is just a professional disagreement. I mean we're just looking at a different so. Whatever. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to convince you. You're not going to convince me. Well, and it, it's not even about convincing. You've paid me for my professional opinion. I've just given it to you. If you throw it in the trash can, I, you know, there's not much I can do at that point. Right. And, and the other thing that you get used to in this business, and I'm the same for you, is you've got to get over your ego quick. A lot of people aren't going to like what you hand them. Right. And they're not going to like what they hear. And you just got to not worry about it yep. and say, oh, okay, fine. You know, it's not a big deal. Right. It just isn't. And whatever, I don't really care. Um, you know, I didn't tell you to do this because I thought it wasn't going to work. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I didn't. I, I, I didn't. I didn't try to get you to hire me to fire me. I, right. I, yeah. Right. I, I mean, right. obviously, we wanted this to work. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I always, I get a, you know, I kind of get a kick out of that, and and I always tell people, you know, look. Um, you know, if, if you don't want to do it, then if you don't want the answer, don't ask the question. Right. Well, it, do you find that, that I, I've, that leads me to something is, do you find that when do people usually hire a coach or a consultant? Do they do it when they need it or do they do it about a year later than they should have? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Um, yeah. So here's what's really, here's kind of the extremes to this. One extreme is they're late to the game and uh, they don't want to listen to you. And when you're brought into the party that late, you probably, one of the, my default positions is, uh, I don't know that they're going to listen to me, right? Because you've needed this for a long time and you've known it and you've resisted it. The other, the other group is a group that's so squared away and they get you in there immediately for a variety of reasons. And, and, and then there's the groups in between, obviously, but those are your right. two extremes. Right. 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 And, and I, I worked with a client for a while and I go, I finally looked at him and I said, I don't know why you hire me. You guys have got your stuff together. And the president looked at me and he said, we have our stuff together because we know what we don't. Hmm. And I was like, all right, cool. Right. right. You know? And, and, and he also said, he goes, besides I, I I'm paying you, and he goes, I'm paying you for something for the value you told me you were going to bring. And that's a different perspective. And that's why I want you here. Right. Even if they have their stuff together, you're still going to have some sort of a. Absolutely. Other, right. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And the other group, I call that hiring me to blame me. Well, yeah. That, that's uh, I, now I get to that, point. That's now that checkbox. Yeah. That's that checkbox yeah. group. Right. Yeah. That's the checkbox group. So, um, you know, I had a situation with a client just last year. We did a pretty big size project for them, and they're they're uh, they were concerned about um, being able to hire people and keep employees. And we said, you know, you need to do this, that, and that, and you'll be able to hire people and keep employees a lot better than you are now. And um, I, I no sooner got it out of my mouth, and I was warned by the the other folks on the team. They said, yeah, he he's not, you know, th this isn't going to fly. I, mean, well, I don't care if it fly. You know, I'm not. I'm not putting it on here because I think it's going to fly. You know, I'm putting it on here because I know this is what you got to do. And um, right, yeah. And uh, and I, I no sooner got it out of my mouth, and he said, "Well, we're not going to do that." <laughs> what was the point? I said, "Okay, <laughs> all right. Here's my invoice. I'll see you later." <laughs> That's like, where do you want to go to dinner tonight, Ned? I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, uh, let's go here. Well, I don't want to go there. What'd you ask me for? That? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to go there. Well, then you, you do know where you, you, you know, yeah. you have some, right. Well, you at least know where you don't want to go apparently. Right. So, so how about instead of me asking 20 places right. to, to narrow it down, how about you just tell me the one that you'll say yes to? I mean, we yeah. can see. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I apparently we've we've we had the same uh, mother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. No, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Do you think 
in your experience, two, how many did you say? 500 businesses, 200, 500 Probably, businesses? Yeah, 400 yeah. to 500, something like that. Do they underestimate the importance of culture? Oh, God, yes. Many do. The really good ones don't. The yeah. really good ones lead with it and they lead hard and they stay on it. You know, I mean, the really gems out there, they, they're all over it. And the other ones don't have a stinking clue and they poo poo it as ridiculous. They lead with culture. That's an the interesting good ones. way. Of putting, yeah. That's an interesting way of putting that. Oh, well, they lead do, with it. Do it's they everything. mistake, do they mistake culture for just sort of letting people do what they want sometimes? Like did, did it's sort of like a free for all. Do you, do you see that? Um, no, well, you know, that's a good question. I don't know if they, if they don't lead with it cause they mistake it for something else. I think a lot of them just don't understand it. Um, yeah, I a think lot, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. A lot of them just don't get it. Yeah. Um, many, usually I'll tell you the other thing is what I, what the, the one thing that I find that kind of holds a, a common theme um, and, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I've spent a lot of times on airplanes thinking about this. And I don't mean flying them. I mean, sitting in the back, you know, staring out the window, you know, after an engagement going, oh, what the hell happened there? Um, what's interesting is the theme is this. Those who get it celebrate the success of others. Really important. They um, delegate down as far and as fast as they can. Hmm. And and they they care about their brand deeply. Those that don't are the opposite on all three of those things. Repeat those three things for me. They 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 celebrate the success of others, namely their employees. Okay. Right. Um, they care deeply about their brand, for certain. You know, and um, they uh, they delegate uh, deeply and as far down as they possibly can delegate. Now, now you, there's a lot of little sub spurs off of those things, Adam. There's an enormous amount of training and that comes off of that success of others. There's this, there's that. Uh, they, they also uh, very much listen and then they make uh, uh, changes. So the two com my two favorite companies that I follow, and, and look, neither of these companies are without their failures, right? Neither of them with, are without their right. stub toes. The, yep. the question uh, of not of a large company of whether they stub their toe or not is how they recover from the stub toe. What do they do to fix it? You know, yep. that to me is the measurement. It's not that you screwed up. You got 30,000 employees. I guarantee you somebody's going to do something stupid somewhere. You know, I mean, the, the odds are against you. I mean, they're stacked against you. But my two favorites that I like to watch are Starbucks and Southwest Airlines. Um, and, and you know, I, I, I will go back and say of... Uh, my three markers here that I like to look at is profitability, safety, and employee turnover. Um, are they safe? Uh, yes, it does. Culture eats strategy for lunch. You're absolutely right. Um, are they safe? In other words, do they do they have a safety culture and do they live it and breathe it and talk it? Um, uh, <laughs> um, the other one is, uh, are they profitable year in and year out, right? right. Um, and then uh, show me their turnover rate of their employees and uh, measured against their peers company, right? Against other fast food, right? Against other, um, not just coffee shops, but uh, others in that service industry that is, you know, uh, more the fast food kind of industry. And, and all, both of those companies rate very high in all three of those. Starbucks, uh, high profitability, Southwest Airlines, employee turnover, extremely low in both companies, right. and 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 the the safety culture and the living it and actually breathing it and doing it, extremely high, right? And and they almost they almost don't care what it's going to cost to make it safer, and and it's not that they haven't stubbed their toe. My gosh, uh, both of them have had some things happen. Both of them, you know, so, uh, Starbucks has had some really uh, dumb things happen um, in their in their restaurants and whatnot. And, and what did they do? They shut the entire system down for an entire day, all 8,500 mm -hmm. restaurants. And they said, this is not who we are. This is not how we do business. And we're going to fix it. And we're going to fix it right now. We're going to be pretty transparent yeah. about it. Right. And, and they did it, which I loved without lopping somebody's head off and saying, see, we fixed it. 
no, no, they fixed it because they looked in the mirror and they said, okay, clearly we've not expressed ourselves internally as clearly as we should have. So let's do it now and let's get that fixed. Right. And to me, that's really important. Now, there's plenty of other companies that illustrate that and I could talk about them all day, but those are just two that I, I watch, you know, the news on them. I kind of pay attention to them. I own stock, a little bit of stock in both, just enough to, because I'm not a big stock guy, but just enough to both that I can look at that side of it. And, and it's just really important to me. And, and so, yeah, those are the things that I like to look at. So you bring up failure and I, I swear every time we talk, every time we're together, we talk about failure and vulnerability. Right. Um, is there, is there an example that you can give me of you stubbing your toe and what you, what you took from it? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, it's not over there anymore. Um, yeah, I uh, I came up with this brilliant idea several years ago that I was going to uh, design and publish a uh, strategic planning process for companies. And once I taught it to them, that they could then do it on their own forevermore. Mm. And I poured an enormous amount of time into it. Um, a fair amount of money. I certainly didn't bankrupt me, but it was you know, more than I care to go back and look at. I can promise you that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I showed it to a few folks and uh, I should have showed it to them a lot earlier because I would have stopped it a lot earlier. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's one uh, right there. And that uh, reiterated to me the lesson of, of fail really fast. Right. Be because now I know what correction I need to make. Figure out it's not going to work really early in the process and then I can make a course correction immediately. It's the exact same thing I teach my, my flight students when I'm teaching them to fly. You know, set your plan, set your course, check your wins, see if, if you planned right. And if you didn't, make a, make a correction and let's plan our, our ground speed for our trip within the first 15, 20 minutes. And then let's figure out the rest of it so I don't get to the end in bad weather and oh shit, now I'm out of gas. Well, that's right. not cool, right? And I, I didn't follow my own advice on this one. You know, I built the whole thing out. I kept it under wraps as a big secret. Oh, hell no. You know, and, and what's interesting is the software industry have, have figured out a long time ago, minimum viable product. Get right. that piece of garbage to the, pro, to, to the customers as fast as we can. Yeah, they're going to bitch about it because nothing works, but then we're going to come out with version two immediately because we're going to figure it out, right? And there's a lot right. to be said for that. You can take it in different ways, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we, now here's the problem. Adam, I've got to work in a, here we're back to this word again, culture that celebrates my going, hey, this didn't work instead of going, hey, you screwed up. How much did that cost me by you making that mistake? Well, shit, I'll tell you what, I don't know how much it cost you, but you're never going to hear about another one again. I can promise you that. In fact, I got a fix for this. I'm not going to be innovative and creative anymore. Screw it. If it doesn't come out of your office, I'm not doing it. I'm going to walk by that trip hazard there because the last time I moved it, I got yelled at because it cost money. Screw it. I'll let somebody trip and break their, their butt and then we'll drive up, you know, uh, our hmm. workman's comp claim because the last time I said, you know, I bought $15 worth of stuff to move the trip hazard and I got screamed at for it. The hell with you. I'm not doing it anymore. And let me tell you, it boils down to those little things. I've heard it a thousand different times. That's fascinating. It, wh why do you think why do you think leaders and businesses are so weird about the failing thing? I, like well, I, just, I don't get it. Many of them confuse it with they work for me, so their failure is my failure. And and the problem is they haven't said, "Oh, awesome that you tried that." What can we learn from it? Right? They, right. they and that's a cultural shift, and that's got to be right. throughout. Right. I mean, that's got to be really ingrained. We've got to really talk and, and, and think about that. You know, Herb Keller at Southwest Airlines was known for years, for years. He would show up on a flight, just show up unannounced. And he'd say, I'm sitting jump seat with the pilots. And he'd say, uh, I'm going to hand out peanuts with, uh, with the flight attendants. And he would just engage in conversation. And, and he found out little things like he found out that the flight attendants, uh, the, the, 
the tray that they had originally when the airline first started to carry the peanuts, uh, uh, Herb said to them, when he was delivering peanuts, he goes, this thing's kind of heavy. And a flight attendant said, yeah, try that for eight hours of flying on a bumpy flight and uh -huh. your back will hurt for weeks. He went back and said, I want, I want you to find new trays for those peanuts tomorrow and get them field, you know, get them sourced and out into the field. And, it, and he just understood that, okay, we picked them. It was a failure. They were the wrong ones. We went and listened and then we're going to change it. Quit getting all wazzed out about it and just fix it for God's sakes. Just fix the, it. The failure is in not fixing it. That's the sin. The sin isn't in picking the wrong tray for God's sakes. The sin is going, I picked that tray, damn it, and it's fine. Well, no, it's not. It hurt, It's heavy and it hurts them and it's not easy on their job. Quit having a fit about it. Yeah, marrying yourself to the wrong decision. Oh. Rather, you know, well, if you want to defend mediocrity, get your ass away from me. Go right. go away. Right. Why are we defending me? Why are we using calories and energy to defend mediocrity? Well, Let's then, be better. Yeah, the world of continuous improvement. This is a big battle in the world of continuous improvement, whether it's lean or agile or black belt or uh, theory of constraints or whatever they happen to be, because we run into this. Uh, not invented here mentality. Hey, I invented this process. It was a huge improvement over the last one. Well, okay, great. Glad to hear it. Guess what? This improvement is a big improvement over this one. And, you know, they talk in lean that one of the first things they teach is uh, you have a current state and a future state of your process. Right. And so you, 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 you say, I want to get to the future state. Well, what they also teach is when I get to the future state, guess what that now becomes? current. So what does that leave us to have? A new future. Right. So go find it. Right. And McDonald's McDonald's leads the way on this one, I think, amazingly. You know, McDonald's will tear down those restaurants and rebuild them in a heartbeat, um, partially due to aesthetics. I mean, that's a big part of it. But let mm -hmm. me tell you what, uh, pull the curtain back on that, and you will find that all the time that restaurant's been up, they've been working at moving the, the button for the fries from here to here. Because yep. that saved them a millisecond on making the fries. Right. And and whoever designed the buck the button to be there, they applauded that when he did it. And the new person that designed moving it in here, they applaud them now. They don't unapplaud the last guy. Right. And and McDonald's they they set that at another level of of good. Southwest does, uh, Starbucks does, um, uh, CVS had a habit of that for years. I mean, there's there's some great illustrations out there of that. And, and one of the places you can find innovation and you can find the celebration of failure and trying new things is a company that really, 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 really brings into their culture continuous improvement, whether it's a name and a process or a behavior. Um, sometimes the behavior doesn't work because they don't have the process to back it up and they just don't know what they're doing, but they're trying really hard, right? And, and so I don't really care what they do. I've gotten schooled on all of them because I have clients that you know, this client uses theory constraints and this one uses lean and this one does, you know, agile. And I'm pretty well versed in all of them because I got to at least have the conversation. I don't run right. the, but I got to be able to have the conversation and know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, they're all work, you know, just right. what works for you and then do it for God's sakes. But we've got to get over this ownership of it's mine, you know, and I, and I designed it. Um, you know, I've learned things. I always say that if you open your ears up, you'll probably learn more from the people that, about being a leader and about doing your job from the people that work for you than the people you work for. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we can learn a lot from, especially with what you're just talking about there. We, we can learn a lot from kids. The oh. way that young kids <laughs> yeah. celebrate each other's successes Right. On the playground yeah. or, you know, before we yeah. screw them all up and make them, right, right. Make you them know, little, argue, little, make them little shitheads right. but, <laughs> and, and arguing with each other and, and what right. a judgy like us. As yeah. Adults. Yeah. Right. But when they just, they, they it's just pure love. Yeah. Right. They, they celebrate. I, I remember a social media post. I think it was last year. I think it was from Woodridge. Somebody had sent a letter into uh, the, the Woodridge school talking about it was a cross country meet and, the 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 Woodridge team had finished and they st they waited until uh well what until they had finished and they were clapping and then they kept waiting and they kept they clapped as the other schools finished you know they had come in first I think and they waited for the other schools and they were cheering them on and cheering them right, on right. and then 
everybody was done. Everybody was leaving, but they knew that there was still someone running. And they waited until this girl was done running right. and cheered her just like she was first right. crossing the line. And the whole reason somebody had mentioned it was because that was their daughter um, from this other school. And they just yeah. thought that it was phenomenal. Right. I mean, we, we, we can learn a lot from, <laughs> from the, uh, oh, yeah. from the youth, right? Oh Before, gosh. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Well, hey, it's been like an hour already. Okay, and, all right. We, we could go like another hour or I could just listen. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just been a listen. blast. God, I've had a, I've had a really good time. No, this is great. I uh, what do you have coming up? You've been doing you've been doing some uh, webcasts and so yeah. So um, you know when when this hit, uh, our business it completely got ripped off the books. I mean, not a thing, a very very little, and so um, you know that. Um, I have a four piece, uh, a mantra that I'm living by, uh, turn panic into opportunity is rule. Number one, protect your brand at all costs is rule. Number two, enhance and in, and improve your digital footprint is rule. Number three and build nothing that's not sustainable long-term. Love so, it. so I'm not doing anything that my clients will buy only now. That I'm building things that they'll buy now, and but they'll also buy it later. Mm -hmm. That's the sustainability piece, right? Right, right. Um, so, uh, and things that I want to do long term. So, one of the things that, uh, just from my own marketing standpoint, is I've been it's been on the whiteboard list forever. Uh, you know, content, content, content. Well, I've never had time. Well, I'm cranking out. You know, sometimes two webinars a week. I'm doing a series of them that are longer. And then I'm doing what I'm calling pop-up 30 minute webinars. Mm -hmm. And then I'm converting them, uh, well, recording them and putting them up on YouTube. And I'm going to use that moving forward. So there's a sustainability piece. It's Absolutely. free. It's free currently. So people can just have it. I'm staying in touch with my clients I'm saying, here it is, you know, yep. don't, I'm still here. Right. Um, I'm also taking a lot of our uh, work and we're converting it to being able to deliver it on an online platform. And um, uh, we're starting to see uh, some appetite. Well, the appetite for it is now there. Clients are now saying where they would not have said before, no, we they, want that in person. They, they right? had to make a mind right, switch. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so I had to shift and, and convince myself, A, I can deliver it this way and figure out how I'm going to deliver it because a deliver different delivery process. So mm -hmm. we've got that figured out. And then I've also added in uh, some other um, services and, and um, uh, trainings that are are really designed beautifully for online and they're gonna we're gonna get those released uh in about a week but the beautiful thing about that is uh 10 years from now i'll still be using this product because what i'm gonna do is something that clients have been asked for forever ned we want you to come in and do this whatever it, whether it's a consulting project on a culture or a training it doesn't matter what it is um, but then do you have a way to loop back with that group in three weeks and, and the appetite has never been to bring me back in. Because if I'm in Denver, they're not going to fly me back out. It's a whole day. It's really expensive. Well, this is going to be now a blended. Yes, I'm going to loop back now with this. And we're going to do it for an hour and a half to two hours. It's going to be online. And it's at, you know, still a value proposition from a, a financial. You know, I still can, you know, do it. And, and it's affordable for them. But I'm also not giving it away. And, right. and it, it's now an economic value add. So there's a sustainable piece. So that's kind of what I've been doing, living in the office here and just cranking out work. And then we're finishing up some other projects and we're developing uh, some new simulations that we can release when we are back in face-to-face uh, -face with folks, which is probably you know going to be whenever it's going to be, maybe a year-ish. I don't know. It's going to be a while. It's not going to be tomorrow. So, right. you know, uh, that's kind of, that's where I am and what I'm doing, Adam. That's very cool. I, I've been on some of your pop-ups and they've been, they've been excellent. I've thoroughly enjoyed them. Keep doing that stuff because you're, you're right. People, you know, it's interesting. I, I did a, I did a video not too long ago, just a live like this, um, talking about the tiger King. Are you familiar with the tiger King? Ned? <laughs> oh, the, right. It, it, talk about a beautiful train wreck. Uh, oh, well, I don't, I don't know how beautiful, how beautiful it is. <laughs> it's a but, train wreck for sure. But what did that guy do? He, he was recording himself all day long, every day to the point the man's in prison and they were able to do an eight part series about him. So 
business owners that don't think that they have time to create content actually are creating content all day. They're just not pressing they record. They, they are. This, this is content. We'll transcribe yeah. this. We'll turn this into audiograms. We'll turn it into YouTube. But actually, we, we should have gone live to YouTube, but it wasn't set up quite yet or whatever. Um, but we'll turn this into quotes. We'll turn it into, you know, I'll give you the transcript. You have access to all that. And that's part of the point of doing the podcast is what? Live cat, whatever it is I'm calling Right, this. right. Yeah, whatever the hell this is. But <laughs> we may just call it, I may rename it Beautiful Trainwreck. That that might be. <laughs> that might it be may what, be the best name for the show. Yeah. That might be it. I, I can't imagine. I, I think I uh, probably outkicked my coverage on the on the first try here. Um, <laughs> it, it'll it'll never be this good again. I'm I'm afraid. Uh, this you you've been fantastic. But uh, the the Tiger King. That's what we can learn about content with the Tiger King. Just press record. You're doing the thing all day, right? right. Just press record. Right. That's tell the story. Yeah, you tell know? the story. So, just tell the story. I uh I want to end with uh I want to end with five five rapid fire questions. Okay, go for it. Brussels sprouts, yes or no? Oh yeah, um, uh, but I need them on the grill and they got to be really crispy. Ooh, I've not grilled them before. Yeah, a little olive oil, some seasoning, throw it on the grill and one of those vegetable things, get them all crispy. Ooh, good stuff. Cool. Ham and pineapple, is that acceptable as a pizza topping? Uh, uh, ham, no. 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 Pineapple, yes. Ham, yeah, a little no. bit, a little bit. If it's a little bit of pineapple, I'm okay with it. But ham, never. <laughs> no, okay. never, never. And I love ham. It's not on pizza. Just not on pizza. No. Mountains or the beach? Oh God, the mountains. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm with. I love the beach. I love the beach. Well, absolutely. Mountains. Yep. There's something about the mountains. Are just. Yep. Oh, I love them. Johnny Letterman, Leno, or Fallon? Oh, Johnny. J gotta be Johnny, right? Oh, gotta be Johnny. <laughs> and finally, what's your favorite sandwich, Ned? Digital. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> Did you think you were going to get me on that or what, man? Did you but, think I was going to come back with bologna or something? <laughs> Hell no. I was thinking maybe a uh, Dagwood or something. I don't know. Oh, don't God, know. no. Digital. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much for, for being uh, my first victim. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, like, like I opened the, opened the thing with, um, we got to know each other a little bit during uh, falls leadership class. Thoroughly enjoyed that. It was outstanding. Um, I, I learned a ton at, at that and I'm glad that we've kept up uh, since then. And I just really appreciate you being, being the first guest. Well, thanks, man. Appreciate uh, you having me. This is awesome. <laughs> absolutely. I'll do it anytime. And I got, well, and I, I got some have you back? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, God, gosh, yes. And I've got some names for you. Um, oh, yeah? Some folks that I think would uh, actually be a step up from this show. And uh, the only thing I'll tell you is one person I'm thinking of, you better put on your seatbelt. So <laughs> awesome. awesome. Well, no, I, I got a couple I of names. For I don't you. know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. The, the whole point was I'm certainly no journalist. I'm not a podcaster. I'm not doing yeah. and, and I don't think of myself that at all. I just really believe I, for some reason, end up lucky enough to find myself in awesome conversations a ton. Well, where okay. I where I learned something and I just I, I I love the conversation right I think you and I talked a couple of weeks ago about we uh, did the comedians and cars thing yeah it, we did what yeah. a neat concept that is yeah. right it, yeah. and it's just talk it's just conversation just a conversation but I think Kathy our our friend Kathy posted earlier uh, real and authentic and that's that's probably the best compliment that's exactly oh, what I'm nice. what I'm hoping for nice nice yeah nice. that's glad to hear it exactly what I'm hoping for yeah so, thanks. All, All right, right, brother. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody, for listening to uh, the Secret Ingredient Podcast live cast, Beautiful train wreck, <laughs> <laughs> where we believe that everyone has a story, and behind that story is where their secret ingredient lives. We want to thank Ned Parks for coming on and sharing his secret ingredient with us. Tune in next time and be a fly on the wall with whatever, whatever happens then. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you. Thanks so much, my man. All Appreciate right, man. it. You bet.